Uh, so I'm Doug, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my somewhat sustainable life in a tiny house. Um, but I want to go back. So I know the focus of this webinar is on builders, and what I've seen so far is just absolutely incredible. And what you will see now is a DIY house, which doesn't have quite the fit and finish. Um, and but I do hope you can gain insights from my house and my process that will help you in your tiny house decision process. So a little background, um, in 2017, at the age of 70, I found myself in Taos, New Mexico, living on social security in a funky, but very expensive rental house. At the time, my housemate introduced me to tiny houses. I consumed blogs, podcasts, television shows, video tours, uh, what have you and immediately decided that my sustainable tiny life was just waiting for me. Um, I decided that uh, I would DIY a, a IRBC, International Residential Building Code Compliant Tiny, not merely an RV, but an IRBC compliant tiny. So hopefully county code enforcement wouldn't red tag me. It would be mobile and essentially self-contained. I needed flexibility since I didn't have land and wasn't certain what my future would bring. I also wanted to minimize my daily living expenses and my lifestyle's impact on the earth. And uh, it would have a dance floor. Uh, yeah, a tiny with a ballroom. I decided I would, um, within a year I'd drawn up plans. I'd ordered a 26 foot Iron Eagle trailer designed specifically for a tiny. And since I couldn't get a building permit without a building site, I arranged for a licensed architect to periodically inspect, and if all went well, eventually certified that my house was code compliant. Um, so my desire for a mobile, low cost and sustainable life led me to a number of critical decisions. The tiny would be off grid. It would rely on propane for heating, cooking and hot water. It would contain a minimum of 100 gallons of fresh water within the envelope, so I wouldn't need to worry about freezing temperatures or how to hook up to a water supply. I mean, I could always do water haul, unpleasant as that is. And being in mountainous uh, northern New Mexico, it would be well insulated, but to maximize interior space with only four inch wall cavities and an eight inch ceiling cavity. So based on these desires, the design placed the tiny, uh, the living room and the bathroom 15 inches above the subfloor creating room for black, gray, and fresh water tanks below. The windows would be very high performance, and the exterior walls would contain essentially nothing, little, but high R-value insulation. No plumbing, no wiring, and minimal lumber in the walls. Okay, so can you, can you do that? Well, first, uh, to help meet my goals, the house is a modified post and beam structure with four by four posts at each corner and at three locations along each side wall with one eighth inch steel cross bracing to eliminate racking. A few two by threes are attached to the interior sheathing and to the four by fours to support windows and some interior elements. The rest is XPS insulation cut to fit. So you can see there's not much in the way of thermal breaks. The and here, this shows the front of the trailer, which will become the kitchen loft. And the front wall shows the bracing and XPS insulation has been added to the side walls. The XPS insulation is, uh, comes in one, two or four inch thicknesses. The four by fours, of course, are only three and a half. So I ended up with my walls having no lumber from the outside to the inside no thermal breaks in the house. The uh, fit of the XPS insulation is not perfect. So the house was sealed multiple times and at every stage of construction with, e with either Prosco air dam or fast flash, which is a liquid applied flashing. The floor is well insulated with a combination of uh, rock, sol rock wool and uh, XPS and is also multiply sealed. So why XPS? Um, this shows conductivity 
test results. And because it's conductivity, lower is better. R value, lower is a better R value. So you can see that brown polyisocyanurate is best. But as the temperature drops, uh, insulation ability of it goes away. It's R2 when you get down to 15. This is centigrade. When you get down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes R2. The XPS is this dark line or dark orange, which is very good. And it consistent. it's a consistently good, uh, well-performing product. The light orange is um, spray foam. It's best insulation, but it's expensive and generally requires a professional installation. So as a DIYer, I chose the XPS as being comeback, as be, being good enough. Uh, Roxel is also great. It's just not as good as the XPS, and I didn't think it would provide the uh, insulation that I needed. Uh, the ceiling was a real pain. I mean, a pain to insulate and, and ensure that it was fully sealed. And in hindsight, despite cost, I should probably have chosen professionally installed spray foam for my ceiling. Uh, lessons learned. Okay, another picture of the kitchen loft end of the house with the end wall insulated and paneling started uh, on the ceiling and the side wall. The insulation sheets are secured by two by fours interior to the house, uh, which also serve as attachments for the paneling. So again, my walls, there's nothing in my walls but insulation and steel cross bracing. Uh, to complete the picture of insulation, I uh, put in really high performance windows, triple pane argon filled windows. Um, you'll see when I show you a cost breakdown, that's the most expensive part of my house was doors and windows. Okay, uh, in addition to well insulated house, I wanted water storage within the envelope. The raised floor living room is supported by steel cross beams to which the floor panels are bolted and with machine screws and captive nuts, leaving room for holding. Uh, that's a black water holding tank. Gray water is back where you can't see it and uh, fresh water tanks. In New Mexico, kitchen sink water is considered black water. Uh, go figure. Um, in the winter, the gray and black water is both um, routed to the septic system, which I had to put a septic system in to, in the property to, to meet environment, state environmental requirements. But during the summer, I can route the gray water from the shower uh, out through a, a separate um, outlet. And, and I use it, I don't have a garden, but I do have a small orchard, which I can water in the summer. And how about mobile? Uh, yes, the house is mobile. I carefully managed weight uh, and fore, aft, and side-to-side -side balance throughout the construction process, uh, which is very important if you think you're going to be mobile. Uh, I ended up at 10,875 pounds, which is fairly light, with 1,495 pounds on the tongue, which puts 14% of the weight on the tongue, which is, uh, which is perfect. This is also well under the common uh, estimate of 500 pounds per linear foot, which would have given me a 13,000 foot, a 13,000 pound house. And this is due to a number of things, including the fact that there's no hardly any lumber in my house. Um, and I did move the house multiple times during construction. I didn't have a construction site and I managed to find places to build it. And then finally, I was able to afford a piece of land and uh, site prep included a septic system to meet the New Mexico state environmental requirements. And I've subsequently added a bit of furnishing, furnishings, but I don't think I've affected weight or balance. Okay, uh, it's time for a tour. Although the tour may be interesting, I hope that every step of the tour and every aspect of the build encourages you to think about what you want in your house. I'll show you my priorities, but you do you. After all, once built, 
you have little flexibility left. So please be sure that your priorities are reflected in your house. Okay, shoes come off at the entry and they go onto a low shelf opposite the door. Coats, hat, and gloves uh, are, there's a coat rack attached to a three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood panel, which is the only wall in the house, which encloses the bathroom. One of the virtues of a three quarter inch Baltic birch wall is that it, instead of occupying three and a half or four inches, which uh, two by four construction would do, it's just a three quarter inch thick wall. The switches for the bathroom light and the water heater are also mounted on the wall. These uh, wall switches, as is true throughout, are wireless and battery free. The RF signal transmitted by the signal by the switches controls relays that power the light and other electronic devices. So don't have what don't don't have as many, don't have many wires, have as few wires as possible. So uh, the bathroom is neither large nor luxurious. Compact, water efficient, and easy care were my priorities. By the way, you'll notice that my finishes are not nearly up to the standards that you saw and will see uh, in the commercial houses, which were just absolutely beautiful. This is a DIY house. Um, so what was the result of compact, water efficient, and easy care? It's a wet bathroom with a composting toilet, which I'll show in a moment. The bathroom's three feet across, go back, go back. It's three feet across, five and a half feet long, and the bathroom door is a glass bifold shower door. The toilet's a separate composting unit, so the water use is zero. The toilet surround includes the birch wall and half inch plywood, again, Baltic birch plywood on the two remaining sides. Uh, composting toilets are permitted in New Mexico as long as you provide a property si properly sized septic system uh, in your property in the event that the next occupant wants to replace the composting toilet with a flush unit. The black, uh, I can't touch my screen. The black bathroom floor is cut and formed from a single sheet of ABS plastic that is turned up at the sides and the corners welded shut. An ABS linear drain located in the shower area opposite the toilet is welded into the floor, creating a maintenance-free watertight floor. The joists under the bathroom floor are sloped for drainage into the linear drain. Uh, the toilet's protected by a shower curtain, barely visible on the left uh, when the shower is in use. And with the shower curtain closed, the shower area itself is three feet by three feet, which is a recommended size for a small bathroom. To eliminate grout and the possibility of mold forming in the grout, the walls and ceiling of the shower are shooter curdy board, which is intended as a waterproof backing for tile, but I didn't, I didn't do that. Instead, it's covered and sealed with fast flash, which is a liquid applied flashing product, and then painted with a high quality exterior paint. No grout, no tiles to fall off in transit, very easy to clean and maintain. And by the way, the sink in the shower area is from a vintage Airstream trailer. Over the bathroom is a storage loft accessible by a library ladder. You can see the black rail there to hold the top of the ladder. One side of the loft contains stuff I haven't yet tossed out as well as a few seasonal items, a suitcase and things of that sort. Since I did my absolute best to seal the house airtight, a uh, Lunos heat recovery ventilation system provides recommended air exchange and also minimizes heat loss. One of the Lunos paired ventilation fans is, is uh, high up on the passenger side wall next to the loft. The other side of the loft contains two 200 amp hour lithium iron phosphate batteries, a modem, a 400 watt inverter and a battery charger, just in case. There is a shore power inlet at the back of the house for a generator that could be used for the battery charger or for power tools that I may want to use in my house, and I have a, I've had to use that. The low power inverter, 400 watts, powers only the free space Wi-Fi antenna and a couple of outlets for wall warts to charge the laptop and phones. Otherwise, the house is strictly 12 volts, no microwave or other power-hungry electrical appliances. Attached to the loft is a, uh, an electrical panel 
holding charge controllers, circuit breakers, and a battery monitor. Uh, the fuse block for the house is also um, mounted there. You'll notice, by the way, oops, that this charge controller, uh, this is blue, indicating that it's char is charging the battery. This one is, uh, it's, you can't tell, but it's green and yellow, meaning there's a fault. The fault was um, voltage too high, and that's because it was 10 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and um, solar panels overproduce when it's when they're cold, and so the well over the spec output they were putting out four panels in series were putting out uh, 105 volts rather than the spec 90 volts. So it set off an alarm and and triggered the uh, charge controller. So 800 watts of solar panels mounted at ground level on the south side of the house completes the solar system. Ground rather than roof, um, so I can brush the snow off. And the mounts are simply farm gates, inexpensive farm gates attached to T-posts, and they can be easily adjusted for a seasonal motion of the sun. In front of the electrical panel is an instrumentation panel containing Bluetooth thermostat, switches for the Lunos, uh, heat recovery system, um, a uh, sea level water tank level readouts, uh, a, second, um, a second water heater switch. What is that? Oh, a, a uh, battery monitor display and a switch for the water pump. I love the Bluetooth, th Bluetooth thermostat, by the way, because I can set back the temperature at night and then set it up to a warmer daytime value before I get out of bed. Adjacent to the bathroom is a hanging closet, a drawer, and access to a six-gallon RV furnace. Um, this lower thing is the access panel, which is held on with machine screws. It gives access to the water heater and the furnace. It houses all RV propane appliances, including the stovetop. And I chose those because they've got established performance, rec performance records in mobile uh, installations. I've got two 30-gallon propane, propane tanks uh, on the front of the trailer. The hanging closet is narrow. It's only 24 inches uh, wide, but a three-foot sliding clothes rod makes full use of the space. And then you can see that there is, below the closet, there's a drawer. So the rest of the house, living room, kitchen, and study extends 22 feet from the back wall, giving a very open, airy feel to the house. The living room floor is three-quarter inch Baltic birch plywood, which can be lifted for maintenance and gives access to the, the water. And I've run electrical lines through there and other plumbing. Um, so one of the reasons for a shoe-free house is that Baltic birch, although it's perfect for my needs, doesn't provide the same industrial strength walking surfaces does oak or a more customary flooring material. The living room is currently configured with a comfortable reading and television chair, a, a small table, which I'm sitting at right now uh, for dining and or study, and one desk slash dining room chair. But everything folds and is easily stowed in, stowed in the study and the protruding shells, you can see here that the shelf for the shoes is gone. And it quickly transforms the living room into a six and a half foot by 11 foot dance floor. So yes, uh, I teach dance and it is a tiny with a ballroom. At the end of the living room, opposite the bathroom are alternating tread stairs. They're, they are to code, they run across the house, so they occupy, it doesn't make a hallway effect. They occupy little space. Uh, under the stairs with access from the living room is a second hanging closet, a uh, cabinet for broom and vacuum, and storage for seasonal clothes, which right now is occupied with, is filled with cold weather hiking gear. Um, my partner and I have, she doesn't live in the tiny house. She has her own big house, but we have six dogs and we hike with them maybe three days a week, maybe four days a week uh, out on the Taos Mesa or in the mountains, depending on the the uh, year, time of the year. 
The study and the kitchen are at the level of the house's subfloor. So they're down two steps from the main living floor, dance floor, living room. And there's a code permitted six foot four inch ceiling, which uh, which allows for a sufficiently, you'll see in a moment, a sufficiently tall overhead sleeping loft. The kitchen includes an RV stove top, an under counter refrigerator and separate drawer freezer that you can't see it in this picture. Both of those are intended for maritime use, so they're, they're robust. Uh, I'm single, I'm pescatarian, and I eat uh, mainly fresh fruits and vegetables, so I did not prioritize a large freezer or fridge. Likewise, since I cook exclusively on the stovetop, I did not elect to have an oven. And finally, I'm quite content to use a laundromat, so no need for a washer. The result is a small, open kitchen, but with plenty of drawers and counter space. The relatively large amount of um, under counter shelving and the number of drawers eliminates the need for any upper cabinets, which as you saw in the discussion, I believe it was of the Fritz uh, tiny houses, really adds to the spacious feeling of the house. The peninsula adds significant workspace and doubles as an eating surface and a desk. The refrigerator and freezer are an, and another two feet of cabinet space are located under the peninsula in the kitchen side. On the far side of the kitchen is a peninsula is a small office with bookshelves against the wall, uh, under the stairs, uh, there's charging outlets, too many wires. Um, prior to going tiny, I had an enormous library, but it succumbed to my current minimal lifestyle. The second uh, Lunos ventilation fan unit is located, you can't quite see it up there, um, it, mounted in the study though, so it eliminates the need for any kitchen exhaust fan. Uh, rolling drawers that are located under the floor are easily accessed from the study. So two steps up and we're on the uh, uh, main floor and come across the stairs. Uh, I don't recommend alternating tread stairs for dogs or small children. Until I got the hang of them, they were not easy. In fact, the first week of living in the house, I managed to trip and fall. I now love them and would not have conventional stairs. Although I'm currently 76 years old, yes, I started the house when I was 70. So it's been a long time in the build and I've been in it for two and a half years now. I love the sleeping loft and don't mind climbing up and down the stairs several times per day. Per code, the top step into the loft is a platform located 20 inches below the loft floor. Because I am short, I'm five foot six, I can stand on the platform and will sometimes I can change clothes there and uh, it's, it's very convenient. Um, because I prefer a single Japanese futon, the sleeping loft is very roomy and I'm able to sit up fully in my bed which is located on the low side of the house. And uh, the emergency egress, which is yellow and is not yet provided with a uh, finished panel. It will be, but it's not now. It's a tightly sealed hatch that meets International Residential Building Code and is consequently larger than the ones provided in house, houses built to the ANSI, to the RV code. Uh, the loft also gives room for a comfortable reading chair by the window. A uh, second dining chair is right now stored in the loft and either chair can easily be moved to the living room when I have a guest. And I love sitting in the chair and it's got a nice view. Uh, a very high-end expensive uh, Walmart dresser is, <laughs> is bolted to the floor of the loft. The open space to the right um, allows me to easily move clothes, bedding, etc., to and from the loft as I need. And yes, the house is, our, uh, is residential code compliant. Um, I, I finished the house. This, you see, this is 1920, is uh, 2022. I finished the house uh, a year earlier, but the architect would not certify it as code compliant until I had gathered enough 
um, energy data, you can certify a house to code by one of two methods. One can be prescriptive. You can see I've got thick walls and lots of insulation, therefore I'm good. But you can also certify a house by performance. Since my walls are four inches thick, it couldn't be certified by uh, prescriptively. So I had together a year's worth of energy use data and analyze that and show the, show the architect that I, in fact, was a very energy efficient house. And then he would give me this letter. So I hope you enjoyed your visit. Uh, I see there's a bunch of chat and question answer things. I don't know how to see those. Oh, okay. I did a lot of, I did do a lot of research. Yes, alternating threads. Um, well, thank you for the nice comments. Uh, I, I do want to go on to some performance matters now, though. Uh, let's get rid of chat. How do I do that? Okay. I use very little water. I'm on a community well with a yard hydrant, uh, but it's not directly to my house. I fill the water tanks uh, twice a month, roughly, less than twice a month. In three years, I've used 5,020 gallons of water, so less than five gallons a day. I use a laundromat, so that it's a little bit of a cheat, but the total usage is less than six gallons a day, and the U.S. average is 80 to 100 gallons per day per person. A um, couple of reasons that my water usage is 10% of the national average is in part the water-free composting toilet. But the fact that I have onboard water tanks and need to fill them when they run low contributes to me make, to making me really aware of the need to conserve water. The more I use, the more often I have to fill my tanks. So yes, I shower, but it's Navy showers. Get wet, turn off the water, soap up, scrub, turn the water on, rinse off, turn it off. Uh, similarly, I wash dishes by hand, but and I never just let the water run. Uh, so I'm very, very conscientious in my water usage. We're back to somewhat sustainable. So I'm proud of the fact that my water usage is so low. Uh, solar electricity is not cheap. Um, I, my solar system uh, cost $4,285.46 from solar panels, including those farm gate mounts uh, to the batteries. And here in New Mexico, I've got, a, I've got a 400 amp hours of battery storage. Here in New Mexico, today is an exception. It's snowing right now, but generally it's quite sunny. And my deepest discharge from in my batteries has been to 225 amp hours of discharge out of the 400. Um, one of the reasons I had had to get the solar, very expensive, um, but it was essential. I couldn't get a building permit since I didn't have a fixed site. I didn't have a place to live at the time. Not having a fixed site meant I couldn't get an address. And the county does not permit uh, the electrical company to give you a drop unless you have an address. So I, it was essential that I used solar. Uh, I could probably go back to the county now that my house is uh, code compliant and is currently located in a fixed site. Uh, I had a septic system put in, so it meets state environmental regulations. But let sleeping dogs lie. You know, don't go, don't go prod the county. Uh, tiny house is pretty energy efficient. Uh, over three years, one hundred and eighty-nine gallons of propane, which is sixty-three gallons a year. So heat, hot water, and cooking have run less than two hundred dollars a year. The 63 gallons plus solar energy came out to 2,000 kilowatts per year of energy use. The US average is 7,300 kilowatts per year per person. Now this is a bit of a cheat because square footage is not included. If you have a big house, probably use more uh, electricity. However, um, if you do some nerdy calculations that I had to do for my architect, 
you get a certain number of kilowatts per square foot per heating degree day, you know, whatever. Um, based on available data, I compared this to energy used for heating in Colorado and found that on average, the tiny perform tiny performed significantly better than the average house in, in uh, Colorado and nearly as well as houses in a particular uh, high performance net zero eco development for which I found data. I used Colorado homes for comparison since Colorado's average climate resembles Taos's, and also since much of, of uh, Colorado's housing stock is newer and built to modern energy standards, whereas, for example, a lot of the house in the East or the Midwest is older and uh, leakier, draftier, not as well insulated. So uh, I'm, if you all, any of you want to do calculations as to your kilowatts per square foot per heating degree day, you can compare to my numbers and see if I'm actually any good or not. Uh, my living costs, annual living costs are pretty low. I net out at $2,306 a year, uh, ignoring county property tax. And the most expensive item is my water. And that's because it's the minimum to belong to the community well. I'm authorized 3,000 gallons a month and I use 150 gallons a month. So yes, I could use a lot more, oh well. Um, and finally, build cost. Yes, it was pretty cheap. Uh, 20, it was $57,000 plus two and a half years of my life. So what do you value your life at? Um, I don't know. It was for me, I'm retired. It was also a bit of a, a bit of a hobby. The cost of breakout also reveals my priorities. High performance windows and doors top my expenses, almost $10,000. I have 13 windows in my house. Um, the next expense was the trailer. I have a, a Iron Eagle trailer, which was custom made for uh, a tiny house. The interior sheet material includes Baltic birch for the floor. I made all of my cabinetry with Baltic birch. A lot of my paneling inside is Baltic birch, so that was not that was not inexpensive. Uh, the so the electrical system is dominated by the cost of the solar system. Fasteners and steel. You saw the steel cross bracing in my house. You saw the steel cross beams under my floor to hold up my my floor. Uh, I've also got a lot of fasteners and screws and bolts and whatnot, and so that was that was expensive. Note, too, that the sealants, this Prosco Air Dam and Prosco Fast Flash, I spent more on sealant than I did on lumber, more on sealant than I did on insulation. So again, it's my house is basically airtight, uh, and I went through a lot of sealant. Um, okay, final thoughts. It's, it's probably become clear during the tour, I was very careful in allocating the commodity, which others have talked about before, and I'm sure others will. Afterwards, space. There's no room in a tiny house. Space is so valuable in a tiny house that you have to prioritize. And I use that space so it's well-suited for me and for my desired activities. I'm not much for parties, no guests other than dancers. I do teach in the house, and sometimes my partner visits and we dance, but I have no large gatherings, no pets, no children. Although I prepare most of my meals at home, I'm not a candidate for top chef, chef top chef, and I don't need a Viking range or a six burner, you know, six burner Viking range or a corresponding refrigerator. They're not in my house. Um, my house is custom designed for me and would certainly not suit everybody. I'm not very tall, I'm five foot six and I'm not especially large. So this also enables features that are particular to me. And I have gone out of my way to avoid emphasizing any features, which although others may value, were not to my taste. I firmly believe that living a comfortable tiny life depends on establishing clear priorities and embedding those in the trade-offs you must make going tiny. I've tried to indicate my priorities in areas of trade-off during the tour. I also tried to indicate that a sustainable tiny may require you to be flexible, 
and think outside the box. And if you do choose to buy rather than DIY, please, please, please work with a builder who has experience building tiny houses rather than a uh, general contractor, no matter how reputable, who has only big house experience. Tiny is different. I feel extremely fortunate having lived in my house nearly two and a half years to be generally comfortable with the priorities I established and the choices I made. Two areas uh, about which I have some qualms are the use of propane, which is a fossil fuel, and the fact that I filled my walls with plastic, XPS. On the other hand, propane is non-toxic and considered by the EPA to be a clean burning, relatively low polluting fuel, certainly better than wood. And there doesn't appear to be a more eco-friendly DIY insulation with suitably high R values. So I simply live with those decisions. So yes, your, your mileage will differ, but the message is the same. Prioritize. Make the house fit your life rather than needing to make your life fit the house. And... How do I undo this? Stop share. Help. <laughs> I don't know how to undo this. Uh, Thank you. So are there, that, that's really all that I had prepared. I, I thought there might be some questions. There's a number of things I didn't talk about, um, but, uh, oh, dance, swing, salsa, uh, lindy hop, uh, tango. And yes, it's not too different from living on a sailboat. Um, sailboat or a float house. No power bill, right? Yes, that's right. It's uh, really cheap in the long run. $4,000 for solar system, which, which gives me all the energy I use, but that's in part because I use propane for anything that requires heat. You don't, if you have an off-grid house, you don't want to make heat using the uh, electricity. And yes, you can get used panels cheap. You can build your own Yes, so these comments here are, are right on. Uh, I was lazy. I bought Renogy panels. I bought uh, lith the uh, lithium ion batteries are uh, also Renogy products. And then I splurged and have Victron controllers, a Victron uh, battery monitor. So th those are expensive. My inverter is a very small, 400 watt. It's a Samlux device, which was pretty inexpensive. And it's, it's done everything I need. The Luno system works very well. Uh, there are multiple. You saw that there were two switches next to each other. You can switch it. Right now, it's set on low speed. And if you calculate the number of uh, exchange air exchanges that are recommended for uh, the number of cubic feet that I have in my house, the low speed provides exactly those number of changes. It can be run at a much higher speed, which I wouldn't do in the winter. There's also a summer mode which it, in which it just functions as an exhaust fan. So if you open windows, you've got an exhaust fan. What you don't want to do is leave the windows closed and run it as an exhaust fan. I did that one day. That was a mistake. The composting toilet has a fan. The Lunos on summer mode is more powerful than the composting toilet fan. So it pulls the gas instead of the fumes from the toilet going up the exhaust stack they came into the house. Okay, so don't do that. Um, what the Luno system does is there's two units that are paired. They have heat exchangers in them. Uh, for six, It's set up right now so that for 60 seconds, one of them blows air out of the house, the other one pulls air into the house. And the one that's blowing air out of the house, he is heated the heat exchanger is heated by the outgoing air. After 60 seconds, they change direction and air comes in from the outside 
through the heat exchanger, which has been warmed, into the house, and house air goes out through the other unit. Uh, I have what's called the Luno short, which are advertised as being 85 or some number percent efficient at extracting heat from the uh, outgoing air. Uh, you can get Lunos long units that are claimed to be 90 or 95, some, some much higher percentage efficiency. Um, I, I should have probably purchased the longer ones. They were twice the money, so I just didn't do that. Um, yes, so Mark commented on the uh, Lunos HRV. Um, and he's right. I have the short duct system. Uh, air exchanger, not AI. I don't know. Ah, oh, you have to. Actually, my partner said we should do some. We should close this thing out with some dancing. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm chiming in there because AI, sorry, it means artificial intelligence. It's faster than typing. My apologies. But the Lunos is an amazing system. I, I'm happy you're using it. Yes. One thing is you talked about a dumb house. Yes. On the whole, whole I don't have a smart house. I do have some Bluetooth connections in my house. My, my uh, uh, battery monitor system, I can see that on my iPad because uh, it's got a Bluetooth connection. I can control my thermostat with the Bluetooth connection, but I can also just walk over and push the button. Um, because I was concerned about having enough electrical energy in the house, because I'm uh, totally dependent upon the sun, and there's always a week or so in the winter, and even here in New Mexico where it's you're socked in, uh, I can switch off my internet. I um, and and so I didn't want to have have to rely on the internet, on having a smart house with internet uh, Wi-Fi running all the time. Absolutely correct. Uh, cross framing. So you mean the cross bracing in the framing. So typically a house has a bunch of studs in the wall, let's say uh, wood or maybe steel studs, and you've got sheathing attached to all of these. And that provides uh, resistance to what's called racking. So your house would maybe just want to tip over. Parallelograms, a rectangle can just collapse into a flat thing. And you don't want that. I do have sheathing some on the outside of my house, but it's only attached to the four by fours. So it's not nearly as uh, resistant to racking as if it were attached to studs on two foot or one and a half foot centers or what have you. 16 inch centers. So instead, I have this, these, as you saw in the presentation, I have steel, um, eighth inch steel, three inch wide cross bracing that is bolted into my, uh, into the top beam and into my floor that prevents racking. And that was one area where the architect was like, okay, this is pretty unusual. So after I built up my, my uh, house, so I had the all the four by four is in place. I had the roof beams in place and I had the cross bracing in place. He came out and shook the living daylights out of it. And he had some laser measuring thing that was as part of his tool setup and noticed that the house shook because it was on wheels, but the structure didn't move more than the base of the house. So it was very, very rigid. Um, it's been tested we had a, a like a miniature uh, tornado come through my right where I live, and uh, my partner was over here. And we were in fact dancing, and I heard some noise like some wind. I looked out the window, and saw my neighbor's roof, beams and all, go flying past the house. Uh, we hardly noticed it inside. Nothing shook. I, I am strapped down to the ground like a mobile home would be with, with. Uh, augers holding the house down. Um, I have the wheels on, but it's up on cinder blocks, so the wheels aren't touching the ground. This allows me to be New Mexico code compliant. Uh, so the the, ra the uh, cross bracing was pretty effective. Um, 
Were there other questions? Alternating threads, yes. And I was really glad, Mark, that you talked about Roxel. I originally was going to make my whole house using the rock wool, the Roxel insulation, and did an, a lot of calculations, and I just couldn't make it be as thermally uh, effective as if I used XPS. So I do have Roxel in the um, underfloor. Uh, I have a sheet of XPS down there, but I also mostly have Roxel, which I love. Um, issues with humidity. I don't have any issues with humidity. First, I live in New Mexico. Okay. Uh, second, the air exchange takes, the, the airflow takes care of that 24-7. I have two things, well, four things that run 24-7, the Lunos paired fans and the fan in the composting toilet. They run 24-7. In fact, I've I've spared I've got the spare fan for the toilet and I've got a, a spare Lunos unit. So they won't, they won't, hopefully won't vanish. Uh, the other things that run 24 seven are my freezer and my refrigerator. Um, complaints about tiny living. No, I love living tiny. Um, my only regret is that I didn't figure this out earlier than I did. Um, advice, my only advice to newbies is this issue that I talked about several times, which is you do you, prioritize, figure out what's important to you. Some tiny houses have got spa-like bathrooms. Do you need that? If you Or do you want that? If you do, get that. Uh, I didn't. You could see my bathroom is very small and functional. It's, it works just great. Um, but that's... That's the most important advice I, I think personally that I think I can give is be sure your house fits your life. Don't move into a house and say, oh, I need to modify my life because and do things I didn't want to do because I'm now I'm living in this tiny with no space without the functionality I need. So you heard my priorities, dance floor, water in the house, mobility, um, yada, yada. And I'm, I'm happy with those. Um, my propane, I have two 30 gallon propane tanks and two additional propane tanks that are the same size. And so this means that they fit in the back of my, my truck. I take them downtown, fill them up as, as needed. So that helps keep costs down. I don't have to have a propane truck come out and deliver. The fact that I've got a total of four tanks means I can go quite a long time before needing to get a refill. Um, let's see. Yeah, and uh, so I didn't shy away from complexity. No, so I did things that you would never, in your right mind, ask a commercial builder to do. Uh, this all this ceiling it took me forever. I would put in a layer of insulation, or I would put in the sh I shield between the sh I seal between the sheathing and all of the lumber that I do have in my house. Just everywhere is sealed. And that took a lot of time. Uh, applying the, the fla fast flash was a bit time consuming. So there were things I did that if you asked a commercial builder to do, he would say, sure, and it would cost you too much. So as an amateur, retired, I have the time to do these things. Um, let's see. Nothing is impossible. Th thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I've got a little bit of time left, not much. Um, but if, are there other? I don't see any other questions here. Oh, are there others? It says Q and A. There's new ones. What would I change or not have done? Wow. Um, and how come I didn't put a water bladder on the roof for hot water? Morty, I didn't do that because I just didn't think of it. Maybe I should have. I don't know. Uh, my contact information is pretty easy. Uh, I'll let me 
and I type if I to everyone. I think I can type in the chat box. And that's me. My first name at my last name dot com. What one thing would I change or not have done? Oh wow. I don't know. There's I mean, this sounds stupid, but there's essentially nothing I would change in my house. I told you I had some qualms about the fact I filled my walls with plastic and that I am using, uh, uh, you know, Taos, New Mexico is 100%, the electrical system here, Kit Carson Electric, is 100% daytime solar, huge solar array out in the desert. Electricity here is very ecological. Um, but because I couldn't get uh, electrical drop and I wanted to be have flexibility, I went with the propane. And I'm a little sad that, you know, I'm, I'm burning a fossil fuel. But uh, I think, Mark, you mentioned that uh, propane is not that, not that terrible for this kind of an application. Let's see. That's it for the questions. Oh. What is this? Three more Q and A things. Okay, so Arthur, I didn't really answer your question about the one thing I would change or not have done. Um, I'm. I mean, it's it's embarrassing to say that I'm essentially happy with everything. And I think I provided my contact information. Do feel free to email me. I can give you more, you know, I can give you more information, uh, whatever you wish to have. I'm pretty open about my house. Um, I've tried to, the, I, I have had a couple of the county commissioners walk through my house and they love it, but it's still, you and it's still classified in the state as an RV. If I take the wheels off, it would be called a house. I left the wheels on, so it's called an RV by state uh, building code. RVs are not permitted in the county. All I have to do is take off my wheels and I'm permitted. Problem is my homeowner's insurance policy mandates that I leave the wheels on because I'm, I'm right up against the national forest and uh, they want me to haul it away in case of a fire. So that's one weird thing about. It. So that's part of why I don't go talk to the county. It's like, Sleeping dogs lie. Thank you so much for hearing me out. I'm uh, I'm happy to hear that some of you seem to enjoy have enjoyed my presentation, and uh, stay in touch if you wish. Are you going to back me out of here, Zach? Yeah, I'll jump on with you here. Uh, well, Doug, that was super, super cool. I loved uh, getting to see kind of like the process of your construction phase there, the process of your thinking of like how you got into it. And uh, it was, we've been chatting quite a bit back and forth in the community. I've seen you answer people's questions on there. And I was always like, wow, Doug, Doug knows what's going on. He's done some research. And now after hearing you do this, it's like, man, you really dove in. You went head first into figuring it all out and doing all that research and whatnot. So. Well, I think I indicated in my bio that I had a very appropriate background. I have a PhD in pure mathematics. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's useful when you're building a tiny house. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh well. Yeah. But, it, but I it it I, you know I have a lot of perseverance, and so yep. if you, by the way if, I recommend that you buy a house. I mean, this was a real process. Find a good builder. If you do build, be prepared. <laughs> to uh, spend, you know, I spent eight hours a day for two and a half years building this thing, except in the winter when it was too cold to work. Yeah, no joke though. Like uh, Mike with Movable Roots said, oftentimes they'll put a thousand man hours into each home. So it's like, that's that's a pretty common thing. When we're building tiny homes, it's pretty common. And, and I'm sure that before you started your tiny house, you probably had dark brown hair. And now after finishing your tiny home, it's all white. 
Is that right? And I actually had hair. <laughs> yeah, you had hair up there too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the process turned yeah. to gray and losing your hair. <laughs> when I started, I figured, okay, a year. A year is plenty of time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Good, 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 good freaking luck. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you spend your time on now? Uh, kind of well, in fact, tonight we'll go out dancing. Sarah and I dance two to three nights a week. That's we fun. Do, we go to the bars and dance the live music. Yeah. As a COVID lockdown project, I started learning Turkish. So okay. now I spend my spare time speaking to my friends in Turkey in Turkish. That's and, pretty awesome. Wow. And uh, when when the weather is nice, um, we hike. We hike three, four days a week. Taos Ski Valley is world class, and it's just nine miles from my house. Nice. So I go to I go to the ski valley. So yeah, I have Love time that. for activities. Yep, love that. Well, it sounds like uh, you're staying busy and whatnot, but it's really cool that you're willing to share your expertise and everything that you learned throughout your uh, DIY project and even just letting people email you. That's a super huge leg up on the on the game there. But also, it is cool to hear your uh, story and to see that you also would recommend getting a builder if there's uh, okay. if time doesn't permit for it. So, but uh, and, and be sure you get a builder such as you see in this in this expo who's experienced. I yep. I have stories that I haven't got time to tell of friends who've got good building contractors to build their tiny. And wow, that was a mistake. Yep. Yeah, it, definitely. It people and the ins and outs of tiny. Yeah, people definitely try to uh, just find a random contractor. And it's like, it's just such a different, it's a whole different beast. It's like building a normal home versus building a tiny house, just so different. Exactly. Well, uh, Absolutely. Really appreciate your time here and excited to do more of this type of stuff with you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. And thank you so much for sharing. Of course. And thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.